me saw for a minute there, didn't I? <laughs> Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter that much, but it just, I decided I can't use that book. Hi, everyone. Because I don't. We'll be starting in a few minutes with Bible study. Yeah, it's just, you weren't sure about that thing, huh? No, I, I just, I, I could find nothing that said that Cain gave <laughs> poor quality <laughs> thing, and that's why God didn't accept it. Well, I think what's the most telling about that is the Lord responding to Cain. Because how often does that happen in Scripture? So our insight into that portion about Cain's gift and Abel's gift should be reflected in God's own commentary on it. Of, of his, like, why is your face downcast? Why are you angry? Um, and I feel like that's the part of the, of the story that Maybe we get missed when we try to answer some of those other questions that, not that they're not important, but, um, I don't know, I feel like we miss the point when we focus too much on some of the things like that. I don't know. So God talks then, and then Cain talks to Abel and kills him. <laughs> Look, yikes. Um, well, I hope. Um... Here we are. I, I suppose it's time now, right? It's 629. 629. It is. All right. Well, it's been a while since we've had Bible study, so um, I don't know if we're going to have many people check in online or not. But uh, I'm here. I'm Major Martin. Also here is Henry. Hi. We got, and Kiara. Hi. And Jacob. Hey. And Andrew. Hello. Major Shannon. Hello. We are here to Palm Yula. That's right. <laughs> that was funny. No? No takers? <laughs> talk, talk, talk room. Room. I think it's hilarious. But I just entertained myself, I guess. Um, we are here in Genesis 34, and it's been a while since we've met, but I think when we stopped at 33, we felt like a real closure, but we totally hit a huge transition in the narrative of Genesis uh, at the end of 33. So I just want us to like recap. Remember, right, right before this, Jacob has finally made his trek away, right, from Laban. He's made his long trek over. Uh, and then he has this meeting with Esau, right? Esau's coming. He sends all the gifts. He sends the people in different groups, you know. Remember, he stays up all night and wrestles with God. Remember? That's, this was that night. Like, he wrestled with God on that night before he has reconciliation or whatever with his brother. Um, and that's when we first... Remember, that night is when he gets called is Israel, right? That was the very first time that suddenly Jacob is Israel. And now, you know, remember, we're like, oh, we're going to go on our way, and Jacob's going to keep going, but Jacob doesn't keep going. Remember, he doesn't go on to where he first met the Lord at Bethel, right? Bethlehem later. He doesn't keep going there. He sets up shop outside of Shechem instead and arranges to get a piece of land. I think that was like that first, that first last chapter or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So... Esau's moved on, and Jacob, instead of going back all the way, he just goes part way, kind of, mm -hmm. and he stays here at Shechem with his family. Um, and that's where we sort of cap off this sudden, like, sudden shift in the Genesis narrative, because it is a shift, just the way it feels. And even though we had a whole lot of God in the last chapter, the last couple chapters, a whole lot of what is God doing, a whole lot of this is of the Lord. If you, uh, if you were able to follow my color coding, you'll see there is like none of God listed in this chapter uh, or reference to him at all. Mm -hmm. And I think that should be the first indicator as an overview of the chapter that there's something different about this that we're supposed to receive from the word of God. But... Um, uh, if you have any prayer requests, I know you're welcome to put them online, and we're going to do them at the end with Major Shannon. 
Um, that would be awesome. So you can put them online or just wait till the end. That's cool. But we're going to cap off with a word of prayer, and then we're going to dig right in to Genesis 34. Boom! Anyone else want to lead us in prayer here? Mm, I will! Here we go. Oh. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your grace. And as we dig back into Bible study, Lord, we just pray that you would watch over us, speak to us from your word. And um, help us, Lord, and encourage us and strengthen us as we go through each day. Watch over us tonight, pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Is that a baby in there? Sorry, there's a lot of screaming in the basketball. <laughs> Hopefully that's good screaming, like, pass to me, pass to me, I'm open. I hope so. Uh, here we are in Genesis 34. Who wants to kick us off here with these first few verses? Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to visit the daughters of the land. When Shechem, the son of Hammer, the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he took her and lay with her and raped her. Well, let's stop there so far. Um, so what's happening so far? We already know who Dinah is, right? We just haven't mentioned her. She was only mentioned one other time. We remember that girls aren't usually mentioned in the narrative, and they're certainly not mentioned in Jacob's kids. But that doesn't mean that Dinah was the only girl. Actually, that's very far from the truth, probably. Probably had lots of little girls. Um, but Dinah's is mentioned earlier because of this story now. So she goes out to visit the daughters of the land. That's code for what? She wants to visit the other ones. She was visiting the other little piggies, right? Yep. Um, when, in verse 2... Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hiv Hivite. Anyone notice anything special about Shechem? The city is named after him. Right? Uh, maybe that's not on purpose. Maybe that's an accident. But if we thought it was an accident, notice what it says next. That Shechem's the son of Hamor the Hivite, the prince of the land, meaning Shechem, not Hamor, right? So, it's a good bet. Shechem is the prince of the land, <laughs> and that he obviously and his father and their family, uh, maybe not, maybe not started the city, but their influence and wealth and. Kind of ownership of that remember like these little city states kind of is huge right huge but check him does something very bad as we see right away right he sees dinah he takes her he leaves with her he rapes her uh and you know if we didn't already have a commentary on if we didn't already know how bad that was Scripture lays out pretty clearly, after this as we read on, that that's obviously bad. All right, despite conventions of marrying uh, girls young, and we can imagine Dinah's probably 13 or 14 here. All right, you can imagine she's a young teenager. She's about the same age as Joseph, in fact. All right, she's a young teenager, um, but the prince of the whole city that they're camped out by, remember, right, where they've been sort of set up shop, uh, rape Steiner. But then we get a big but in verse 3. So, who, someone read verse 3 and 4. He was deeply attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father, Hamor, saying, get me this young girl for a wife. All right, so just everyone's just take so far. Um, 
we already can say Shechem did something real bad, right? But if we were going to take what happens next, does your opinion of Shechem grow or diminish? I think it's a more positive thought that he, he's, he's going to marry her instead of love her and leave her. Well, I think he's maybe a little foolish in thinking that there's a, there's definitely an entitlement um, that I can see. Um, like I'm the I'm the prince I'm of the, the land. I'm the prince of the land, and I can just take and do whatever I want. I mean, we haven't gotten to that part yet, but I think he's going to be a little surprised. Um, to know that Diana has some protective brothers, right? Well, I don't think he should be that surprised because the whole community knows. Uh, remember, Jacob is a large cohort with a lot of people and a lot of possessions. He's a big player. Right, right, he is. So I don't think that's unknown. So maybe what you're saying, Major Shannon, is maybe he just didn't care. Um, Disrespected the family. Or maybe, uh, can we throw this out? Maybe. He does this act and then thinks, I'd better make this right. Right? Because. I think that's what Henry was saying. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. I got the impression that maybe he was um, repenting of what he did or feeling bad about what he did and was going to try to fix it. But I also think when he took her, this is my country, my. Thing. And if she's here, she's mine. She, she's mine if I want her. Mm. Well, the only thing that lends itself to um, his his like insight into his mind is what the narrator t tells us, which the narrator tells us a lot more than we have heard before. Suddenly, we get he was deeply attracted to Dinah. Uh, we already know he raped her, right? So I, I don't know why they bother sharing that unless it has some significance. And he loved the girl. And he spoke tenderly to her. So there's three different descriptions in there of him wanting more than just, just whatever happened. That's a lot. And as it comes to our insight into the feelings of biblical characters and like and what God's trying to say to us about that I think it means something there right? it's a lot to say so we've got this big but in verse 3 um, and then so we've got so in verse 4 we have this so that we already heard so Shechem spoke to his father Hamor saying Get me this young woman as a wife. And that would be the socially acceptable custom, even if there was some dirty dealing before. Um, because she would have already been, in the society's eyes, defiled, right? Uh, and sort of marked, if you will. And so him accepting her as a wife uh, would, be a, would be positive for her, right? If you kind of think of... Uh, think about, I know it's not the same as several hundred years removed, but if you think about like Mary and Joseph, well, Joseph was going to quietly like sort of step away, but instead he, um, he took Mary. Now granted, Joseph hadn't done any impropriety there, but taking her anyway was him making up for an impropriety that was perceived even if it wasn't real. Does that make sense? So here we have Shechem maybe reaching to make something right that was, like, it was an impropriety and it was his, right? Yeah. Well, it, it makes her not a little less unhonorable because normally they would just leave her and she'd be, you know, without a husband and without... You know, most men would say you've been defiled. Right, without prospects for a husband in that culture yeah. also. Right? And she'd be rejected in 
whatever, but he was going to take that part away by marrying her, by marrying her, the impropriety that he did wouldn't directly affect her as much. Not if he took her as a wife. Yeah. Right. Because then she'd be a married woman and respected, especially if he was an important person. Um, well, well the, the thing about all this is that he has all the agency, right? He has all the, he's doing all the action. It's all about what he's doing. And the point of that is that she doesn't have a choice in this. Yeah. Um, in that it's, in, all, in many ways, an injustice. Not just the first two, not just the second verse, but also in the third verse as well, it, it shows that it's not. A, it's only about what this other random guy. Not wants. random. Prince, the prince of the land. Right. This other guy that she does not know, this other person that is a stranger to her, what he wants. Well, that's presuming. You're, what What makes you think that he's a stranger to her? Well, um, I mean, are they not new to this area? Are they? Did they just come here? Right. Well, we don't have a, a full timeline, but it probably hasn't been there long, but long enough to have known them. Yeah, I think so. So your injustice. Uh, is more on like women's rights here rather than I'm, I'm not sure I agree that that's the point of the story. Well, no, 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 like what I'm saying, I'm not, I'm not saying like a woman's rights or whatever. I'm saying that because she didn't have any rights in this culture that it is framing it in a way that it's all about this Shechem guy um, but it probably shouldn't really all be about him, should it? Well, I want to redraw what you've said because I agree with part of what you said that it's redrawing it like uh, in the culture and this whole part of scripture certainly is but I want to say also that this is also redrawing it in the frame of sin mm -hmm. right and and I think here the sin everywhere is rampant um, mm -hmm. it may be bigger than we can even perceive so you're saying that the, the sin it's focusing on him because the sin is his is what you're saying I think it's focusing on sin, but I think we have to get through the trap the to make that assessment to probably get through the whole chapter. But um, there's more, there's way more sin that happens later too with other actions that happen with other characters. Right, and um, you know I don't think even Jewish people would use this narrative as like you know you wouldn't say you wouldn't say this is a defense of rape being bad because I don't think you have to defend that as being no. bad. Right? There are some things inherent in culture we don't have to defend, and hopefully we don't have to defend as bad. And so, um, to that same end, this isn't really about that. It's about sin in general. I wasn't trying to say that. No, I know you weren't. Um, At times, I'm, if a woman was caught in adultery, she was brought before people and persecuted and stoned and whatever, but the guy never was. Right. Um, and the law. He, and certainly well, in God's eyes. Yes. Yeah. So. You know, so, because that's what bothered me with the woman that they brought before Jesus. They mm -hmm. bring her in here, and where's the guy that was caught? Right. You know, she was caught in the act. There was another guy involved. But, and then that story, that's a jump ship, but I think that was less about, you know, like, uh, that there was another guy who was also guilty, but more about the forgiveness that yeah. the accusers were bringing, that no one wanted to give forgiveness. Um, no one wanted to bring forgiveness because they couldn't wrap themselves around that, um, which was what Jesus brought. Well, anyway, sorry. Uh, here we go, verse 5. Now Jacob heard that he, meaning Shechem, had defiled his daughter Dinah. But his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob said nothing until they came in. I think that's a lot of information also about Jacob handling a very delicate situation, right? Yeah. 
Gotta finish our work first before he tells us. <laughs> well, I think it's maybe foreshadowing. Uh, maybe it's foreshadowing the reaction of the brothers to this horrible injustice, who are a lot younger and rash, right? Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. Someone want to read verse 7? Now the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard about it, and the men were grieved, and they were very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by sleeping with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing ought not to be done. All right. So consider how many times Scripture has just told us that this is bad news all over. Right. Right? So the kids are in the field. Uh, they came in from the field and heard about it. They were all grieved. And then they were all angry. And frankly, Scripture could have stopped there, right? But it doesn't. They were angry because... He, meaning Shechem, had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by sleeping with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing ought not to be done. That is the first time that collectively, area, people, culture, that, remember, Jacob just was named Israel, right? Suddenly, he's a people here. And now a place, a disgraceful thing in Israel, and such a thing ought not to be done. But if you didn't know, have common sense already. If culture was teaching you other things about your rights as a man, or about the proper way of sexual relations, etc., whatever, if you didn't know when you read this right here, and there was any question in your mind, no matter whether you're a Jewish or not, I don't think you can miss that that kind of thing ought not to be done, right? It's disgraceful. Um, it has brought nothing but grief and anger and horribleness. So I'm just saying that the narrator is really exact here, and we haven't had such exacting language in some of the other narratives here throughout Genesis. So the change in voice, I think, is kind of distinct. Any other comments on that section? All right, so Hamor, remember Shechem's father comes. Um, but actually, Shechem also comes with it, we find out a little bit later. So Hamor does the talking. Remember, he's the actual head of the house, right? Mm -hmm. Hamor spoke with them meaning Jacob and his sons, saying, the soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him in marriage. And in the language, that wording is very emotional. It's very, it's very like, like my soul long, like as sort of as a deer panteth for the water. This is like a very beautiful, like, um, like my my son's soul absolutely longs for your daughter. This is not like a, uh, I don't want to say what it's not like, but this his way of wording this, and I would say then apparently possibly what Shechem really feels here is a real um, a, a real love and desire to um, I don't know really make things right, but to really love and show affection to Dinah. But we just heard it in a very special way. And an entreatment. Please, please give her to him in marriage. Right? And he talked tenderly or whatever to her. Mm -hmm. You know, it gives the impression that he, though he raped her, he treated her with some emotion and love. Right. Not to rape in a twisted way. Yeah. Well, when we read about, like, later in, like, Kings and Chronicles of, 
other dirty things happening like that, um, like this example, friends, we never hear about this kind of thing. You know, this commentary on it is very distinct yeah. and special, right? The Hamer goes on. So he says, my son longs for you, songs for, <laughs> longs for his daughter. Please give her to him. And then this is bigger for the community. Because remember, now suddenly they're Israel. <coughs> and intermarry with us. This is a bigger proposition. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. So you'll live with us and the land shall be open to you. Live and trade in it and acquire property in it. So this isn't just about Dinah here. Hamor has said, let's be a part of people together, right? Let's, you be a part of us, we'll be a part of you. We're gonna, we are gonna grow into one, like into a big family here. But it sounds like he's given Israel like right of living in his country. They won't be foreigners. Well, well, you can trade here, you can buy land here. And I want to say it again. Uh, I don't think Jacob was ever supposed to be here. Personally. I, I, I think he was supposed to keep going. Right? right? Um, and I think the, the fact that such an atrocious sin happens here is just more evidence of that. Um, but anyway, that's my own commentary. Um, the Major Martin commentary on Genesis 34. Um, then we get down to verse 11, and Shechem speaks up, right? Shechem also said to her father, meaning Dinah's father, meaning Jacob, to her brothers. So Shechem addresses both of them. Notice they're all angry. He says, he entreats them, let me find favor in your sight, and I'll give whatever you tell me. Right? And then he goes on. Demand of me ever so much bridal payment and gift, and I will give whatever you tell me, but give me the girl in marriage. So if you're looking at Shechem now, now that we've gone from his atrocious sin and more narrative, now through verse 12, where he gets together with his father, they make this entreaty to Jacob and the brothers, oh, please, Let's not just not just Dinah, but all of you. Let's let's make this right. What's your opinion now of Shechem and Hamel? Well, they're agreeable, I guess. <laughs> right. You set the bridal gift. Right? And the bridal gift should be coming from Jacob, shouldn't it? Am I wrong on that? Shouldn't it be coming from Jacob? The dowry for a wife, right? So Shechem says, let's do it the opposite way, right? I'll give a bridal gift. Right? Am I crazy? No, I think you're right, but I, I also think Shechem is showing a deep love or desire to have Dinah, willing to pay whatever you want to forget about what I did and let me have it. Right. Jacob doesn't answer. <laughs> Jacob, the head of the family, doesn't answer. And I know we were just about to read that, but... But the brothers do. Right. But the brothers answer. Remember, I mean, the, brother, the other brothers are getting older, right? But Jacob's sons answered Shechem and his father Hamor with deceit. We haven't heard very much of that word except for with Laban and with Jacob. Right? Mm -hmm. So suddenly, um, <laughs> suddenly deceit. Because, why? Why did they answer deceitfully? Because he had defiled their sister, Dinah. So we don't get that this deceit is linked to, uh, they, they wanted to, you know, 
do some bad things to the whole city or they wanted to whatever they wanted more money in position no they wanted revenge because he had defiled their sister Dinah this was straight up revenge right and they said to them in verse 14 they and this does not include Jacob the brothers said um, and I don't know if this is wise of Jacob uh, to let this happen uh, this way and to like let the brothers talk we cannot do this thing that is give our sister to a man who's uncircumcised for that would be a disgrace to us only on this condition condition will we consent to you if you will become like us and that every male of you will be circumcised then we'll give our daughters to you and we'll take your daughters for ourselves and we'll live with you and become one people. But if you do not listen to us to be circumcised, then we'll take our daughter and go. Now, I know you guys have read the rest of the chapter, so you know what happens after this. But I want to point out, remember the my color coding. God was not mentioned at all. Right? What is circumcision? When is the last time we've talked about circumcision? Abraham. Right. The covenant with God. <laughs> right? Right. Which is to for them to be set apart as a chosen holy nation, a chosen people before the Lord. So this is just all about become a part of our gang. Because <laughs> you have, you've defiled our sister and now you must pay. Because I don't think anybody really as an adult wants to go through that. I'm just guessing that that's a, <laughs> not a positive experience as an adult to go through I'm, that. I'm guessing not. <laughs> um, I'm, guessing, I'm guessing that is right. not a positive experience to go through as an adult. <laughs> Um, you know, in 17, if it's her brothers that are talking, they call, they say, we will take our daughter. It kind of gives the impression that Israel was involved. Well, and I think there's, I have two ideas about that, Henry. One is that either, either he wasn't involved at all, and it makes sense in the culture that they would own, like, or like conceive of Dinah, even though Dinah is her sister, that they are they are like head of her, just in the same way that Laban did with Rachel, right? Um, even though Laban wasn't her father. Wait. No, no, Rebecca. Rebecca, thank you, thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> Got these steps. That was really important. It was a really important statement. It mattered a lot. Yeah. <laughs> But, so the one idea that I think is that he wasn't involved. Two, is that he was, and scripture has removed him from this deceit on purpose and pointed it to his brothers, to his, to his kids. And I think that, that could be the case too, frankly. Um, but we get the idea, of, of course, at the end of the chapter that he did not know about the deceit. And about what would happen. Mm -hmm. So, if he if he was like this was part of his idea, um, it would be funny that he wouldn't mention the whole reason to be circumcised, right? Which is not mentioned at all. Um, and I would think, I would hope that after wrestling with God mm -hmm. recently, um, that uh, that maybe he would. Kind of get that through so i'm more of a fan of the he was not involved with this um but but i think it's plausible to say both that both could be true well i think clearly scripture has separated him from the deeds of the kids but in a way no matter if it's them or him he's still responsible that's right, which is his complaint at the end of the chapter, right? <laughs> um, there, it's just really sad. It's just really sad that circumcision here, this sacred covenant with God, 
is so Dinah was defiled first, right? But here, here God's covenant is defiled by those kids. Completely. Before anything else happens, the fact that they had not connected with God and that circumcision was a thing that just happened, that's the a defilement. Another defilement has already happened, and a much I'm not trying to belittle what happened to Dinah. I want to say a much more serious one, and one I think points us to the real seriousness about this chapter in sin. So, oof. Does this give you a, a little chills here? Like, oh, man. Oh. Uh, oof. We now, have a pretty low down, dirty trick. Hmm. You know, and I'd have to feel like the other times I've read this, I've been like, oh, well, yeah, well, that makes sense. So it defines them as Jewish people. But, you know, after going back through Genesis, like the seriousness of what it meant that they would lo have lost that, right? Um, that is, just, that's sad, real sad. Maybe that's why the wrestling, right? <laughs> um, verse 18, I, I don't know how this is true, Major Shannon. Especially after what you said. But now their words seemed reasonable to Hamar and Shechem, Hamar's son. We already knew that it's, again, scripture, the narrative here is so distinct. Like the family connection. We already knew that Shechem is Hamar's son, right? We, we already knew all of this. We actually learned that a while ago. But the young man, meaning Shechem, did not delay to do this. Because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. I don't even know why we have that sentence there. Right? Again, we're hearing this again. It sort of screams a little bit of um, first couple chapters in Genesis, right? Where we have, like, have to hear it again, what we already know. Suddenly, we have to hear this again. Now, he was more respected than all the household of his father. So we've just learned a whole lot about Shechem. Right? I'm not saying he's redeemed from his atrocious sin. But scripture is casting him not as the arbitrator of this horrible wrong, which we know he was at the beginning, right? Scripture is not pointing to him as the horrible aggressor here. It's pointing somewhere else, isn't it? He's respected, he was delighted, and he did not delay to do what he had to do to make this happen. So Hamar and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the people of their city, saying, These men are friendly to us. Therefore, let them live in the land and trade in it, for behold, the land is large enough for them. We'll take their daughters in marriage and give our daughters to them. Only on this condition will the men consent to us to live with us, to become one people, that every male among us be circumcised just as they are circumcised. Will their livestock and their property and all their animals not be ours? Let's just consent to them, and they'll live with us. And all who went out of the gate of his city listened to Hamor and to his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city, which is everybody. Right? There's one gate into the city, right? Uh, everyone. So, granted, uh, Hamor clearly is in, like, the big, a big boy in the city. Uh, I think it's plausible to say that Shechem um, was named after Shechem. <laughs> I think that's plausible. I don't know if that's true, but plausible, right? Um, and in his entreatment to all the rest of the people of the city of what I think is a huge ask, right? Um, it works. He entreats the whole city to do this, right? So, clearly he was passionate about making this happen. Right? Because the alternative, he could have said, no, but we're okay. <laughs> right? and, and it seems like he had a way out. But that wasn't part of the deceit, was it? You know, it's significant to me 
that the Jewish boys were circumcised when they were babies. Circumcision as an adult is a whole different thing. I, I've heard how when a boy is circumcised, they cry for a few minutes. Circumcised as an adult. I want to stop thinking about it, Henry, but thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> you know, that's a huge request for men. I think it's a huge request, too. Um, and it's supposed to be the identifier of them as God's people. You know, I don't know that I've ever considered that before. Like, I don't... There is just such significance about this, and it it's even significant to us in like the the this was this was uniquely specific and I mean we we don't we don't circumcision isn't a sign of, of your relationship with the Lord or your you belonging to the Lord anymore, certainly. But we throw things around often that are unique and special to us as Christians too. Um, and I mean, this is, this is like almost a manipulation of the covenant. It absolutely is. And really reminds me of the importance of, you know, when we, I don't mean that this, I'm, I'm not, I'm equating these two things in my mind and they're not necessarily, the equity of them is not necessarily the same. But I just think about like our behavior, like when we wear a cross around our neck, you know, that other people would see it. Or when we have a little fishy symbol on our car and maybe don't live or drive <laughs> like we um, are witnesses for the Lord. Um, even throwing the name of the Lord around, if you will. Um, you know, like, oh my God, and OMG, you know, and all those things that we do. It just reminds me, again, that this is like the first time that we really start, maybe not the first time, but it's blatantly the first time we really start to see, like, this um, holy covenant that God made with his people and the sign of the covenant that is just totally distorted in selfish ways. This is purely selfish, manipulative, nothing holy, nothing God-ordained about this moment. And it's so sad. Well, in a way, we saw the sign of the covenant being Eden first, um, and that life being the tree of life. Um, we, Cain was the first defiler of that well, I guess Adam and Eve, but he was a real first defiler of that, like, really sacred life, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And um, um, here it is, here it is again. Yeah. The gar the gar it's the garden again. Um, mm -hmm. And as the narrative unfolds, we know how important circumcision is supposed to be to them. So we can look at the story and say, I can't believe, can't believe that they've done that, right. this sacred thing. And to your point, Major Shannon, how many people look to us and say, oh my gosh, how, how can you meet in church on Sunday because of this thing that you don't honor, that's supposed to define you right. as a Christian, right? right? Um, and it says something about the circumcision of our own hearts should truly be the reflection of us as God's people. Um, anyway, good point, Major Shannon. Uh, no more of what Henry keeps talking about. <laughs> it's on the third day. The third day? Yeah. That's kind of unique. Or maybe not. I don't know. The third day. We hear that a lot. Yeah, if we didn't know that the third day was rough after a, an adult circumcision, right? <laughs> now it came about on the third day, narrative tells us, when they were in pain, that two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, died as brothers. 
each took his sword and came upon the city undetected and killed every male. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the edge of the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house and left. And I want to stop there because the rest of this is like the extra commentary of it in a way. So the deceit was already finished, right? Um, they didn't just kill Hamor and Shechem, though. Everybody. They killed everyone. I think it's ironic that in this first time in Scripture where Israel is referred to as a place where suddenly Israel, Jacob, and the whole host of his family is Israel. Um, that this group punishment, which is undeserved, on this whole city, right? Uh, everyone in that city, all everyone is punished for Shechem. All of them. Sorry. Connor? I was just playing games with a little joke about it. No. No, I, and I'll say too, like, um, in the world the culture, uh, we can see something like that in a movie and think, like, man, that was like vindication for the wrong that has happened. Like, they have <clears throat> gotten their revenge fantasy on this guy and his whole town, right? Like, everyone he cared about, probably. Um, and it could be painted in a different way to almost glorify that. I feel like if it was a movie, they would glorify that almost. Um, it was an action movie, for sure. Yeah, um, but they purposefully, they leave in all the gritty details um, and make it clear that this sin is is the worst sin, um, is, is the sin that they are, um, they are just hypocrites and that they are, they are the defilers as well, um, making them no better than the people of the land because they're in. So we need to look at it as not just that they went and murdered a whole bunch of people and destroyed all of those families um, throughout the city, right? So probably several thousand people, whatever. Um, so it wasn't just a sin against all those people and killing them. <laughs> they had then submitted themselves to the mark of being God's people. And then they were killed. I just want to put that in perspective. The defilement that Major Shannon talked about, like, of circumcision and how sacred that is supposed to be. So they didn't just defiled slightly they took it to the ultimate extreme and then if that mark which should have been also part of their relationship with the Lord which they did not talk about or care about apparently then they really were slaughtering their own family in God if regardless of what you want to say about mankind right their, their sin uh, got multiplied so large there, um, so, so large. Um, and most of the people they killed were innocent. Yeah. Right. They didn't do anything. Yep. Right. Right. Just, just taking the king and the prince's advice and doing what they felt was the right thing so that they could be unified with these new people who had come into their land, which is really the story that, I mean, the, the belief that they had. Right. I mean, they really thought that they were doing it for peace, and instead, instead, it was a bad, that third day was a bad day for them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not trying to laugh. No, that's a, no, it's, it's, it's horror. This is a horrible story. It's a horror movie story. Yeah. Is what it is. <laughs> Uh, verse 27, Jacob's sons, 
Um, and this is a bit more intrinsic, not just Simeon and Levi. Came upon those killed and looted the city because they defiled their sister. In case we didn't know that yet, that might be the sixth time we've been told, by the way, well, in verse 27. And it isn't they. They blame the whole city, They don't blame the whole city for what, which, okay, just being honest, we can see, not unlike what we do, you know, like, I'm not going to get political, but, you know, we like, we put people into groups, you know, even with what has happened within our country the past several years. I mean, we have grouped people together, even politically. Like, like what happened in the 90s when we started saying, like, why do we have all these labels? <laughs> now, now, apparently, we like having labels again. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, um, well, and, and, you know, if, if someone, if someone is, is, has hurt my children, I'm I'm probably going to be upset with all of the people that they associate with too. You know, I mean, I think that might be just human nature, but man, I think a lot of people died for the for the sin of uh, one dude. Right. Shechem, the princey poo. And if I can say on the overarching sin was not against Dinah, um, and it wasn't against the people in that city. The overarching sin here is against the unspoken person who was never mentioned. Not even once in the structure. Right. Wow. Um, they captured, they looted all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives, even, even everything that was in the houses. By the way, that's, again, they could have just said, and they looted the city. No, they took, I mean, they, like, this is verbose here. This narrative is verbose. Uh, <laughs> all of their wealth, all of their wives, everything that was in the houses. And even though Simeon and, Simeon and Levi, this implies all of the rest of the brothers. If you remember, Simeon and Levi are the pure brothers, uh, right? From Leah, right? Because Leah is Dinah's, Dinah is Leah's daughter. Right. right. Remember Jacob's like circle of, of wives here, right? Well, all of them. Yeah. I mean, Simeon and Levi led the charge. You can imagine. Rachel only gives Jacob two children. Yes. Two boys. I and it hasn't say. had Benjamin yet. In the she hasn't had Benjamin. No. Joseph is still alive. Yeah, Joseph, Joseph is probably dying his age. Well, well, whatever. Yeah. You can imagine that uh, Simeon and Levi are about like 19, 20, and you can bet that they're like leading the charge of the rest of the brothers. They're giving them hype. Yes. They're the hype guys. They're the hype guys. In not a good way. <laughs> no, not in a good way. I think a lot of this, part of this story as well is a lesson against, mm -hmm. um, I think, relevant in terms of you know, modern day, we're trying to fight against injustice. But when our, but when our, our actions don't necessarily match our intentions, we just create more injustice. Um, the, the actions that they took against this injustice that happened to their sister, um, it was, it was terrible and um, they just ended up um, perpetuating the injustice further, right? Like, they made it worse. <laughs> they made it worse. That's what they did. Yeah. Well, and to your point, Jacob, um, if you look at this chapter and you're thinking to yourself, I'm socially justice-minded, whose social justice are you looking for? Dinah's? Uh, Shechem's? The brothers, Jacob for that matter, probably if you were saying, I am an advocate for social justice, probably you hit all one of those or people in the city, but likely you'd miss the person in the story that I think uh, is really about is the Lord who 
the injustice is written all over there in the in the circumcision, right? That that's the injustice that is screaming out here, and that's the one that is not um, that's not answered here. It, just it, a, just a comment on that, I guess. With the way they did that, it kind of detracts it all from them being circumcised to represent God as a a sacrifice or a sign. But when they go out and kill people by using that as a weapon. Right. What kind of track record does it set then for circumcision? Yeah. Right. <laughs> what does it mean like to them? They, they, their circumcision didn't mean anything to them. Yeah. I can use this to destroy them. Right. Yeah. And they did. And they did. There are so many, so many points in this that I've really never even considered. Yeah. I've never, t I've never considered this story. I really haven't. Well, and I know we're running out of time here, but in verses 30 and 31, then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, and truth to the, to the whole household then, you have brought trouble on me by making me repulsive among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And since my men are few in number, they'll band together against me and attack me, and I'll be destroyed, I and my household. Now, I think this lends plausibility to Jacob not being a part of the full deceit. Yeah. But it also makes him sort of uh, sort of the unfortunate player and not recognizing the real sin here. Mm -hmm. And what is Jacob thinking about? He's thinking about himself. Thought he was thinking about himself. Right? He didn't do anything. He didn't. Which is part didn't. of the problem. Right, he was complicit. He was I complicit mean, by inaction. By inaction. And he didn't take the opportunity to stand up for the Lord and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. When the, when the brothers are speaking over him, quite frankly, what should have been his words, not his son's words, speaking for their sisters, his word as the father to say, no, you can't have my daughter, or maybe we can make a deal, but then the brothers conjure up this goofy circumcision thing, and he could have recognized the defilement against the Lord there. So sad. You would think the guy limping to talk, <laughs> limping to, talk to his sons um, would remember the reason, right? So, so sad. Sin by not doing his job. Yeah. His job would have been to stop him. Yeah. He it, was the father. Yeah. He was responsible for his sons. And because he chose inaction. Right. Yeah. Then, you know, I think it's wrong of us many times to think I didn't do anything, so therefore I didn't sin. You know, we can sin an awful lot by not doing anything. Right. Right. <laughs> Sort of, um, not to throw David under the bus too, but his inability, and well, not just Bathsheba, his inability to effectively parent his children um, was part of his biggest downfall also. Um, and in a sense, here we have Jacob, um, by his own admission here, if the point is bigger and it's about God, because I'm saying that as a, pl a very plausible, if that's the point, Jacob's missing the point here, as we can read in the narrative, right? Um, they said, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? Well, obviously, no. Um, but in a sense, in a sense, it was the Lord who was raped with the covenant being torn asunder uh, in, this, wow. in this horrible way. Okay. Right. It started with Dinah, um, but at the end of the chapter, it's really, it's really the Lord and the covenant that has been... Um, defiled. And I, I would take offense that Shechem treated her like a prostitute. Yes, he raped her, but he spent the rest of the whole time trying to make it right. You know, he didn't treat her like a prostitute. Okay, I'm done. You know, go on your way. He did every effort he could 
to re repair what he had done. It, um, it might be an obscure reference, but this mention of the Canaanites and the Parasites, that last time that we hear about them, heard about them, was the separation that happened between Abraham and Lot when his family got separated. Remember how hard that was for Abraham if you were here for that yeah. chapter? Remember how gut-wrenching it was? Remember how lonely Abraham felt like, this is my only connection with family, uh, and they were fighting, and it was, part of, that's the last time in Genesis 13 that this that is referenced. So suddenly in this devastation of covenant, um, suddenly, um, here it is, like, slightly mentioned again here. Maybe maybe it's obscure. Maybe I'm taking it out of context. But it's suddenly brought back. Right. Jacob missed it, and uh, so everyone else. Anyway, I know we're running out of time, so we're going to... Oh, I hope you guys like this chapter. It was really deep. who we've been asked to pray for, obviously. Um, Charlotte continues to remind us to pray for Harmony House and those who are struggling with COVID. And um, absolutely, Charlotte, thank you so much for reminding us. Um, and to us personally, as a core family, we think about um, Deb and Ralph. I know that on the stream on Sunday, Ralph had mentioned um, his foot continued healing and some doctor appointments that he has for his foot. Um, let's continue to pray for Harold in Colorado. I haven't seen him on tonight, but um, if they pop on later, we're praying for them. And then Barb and her family, in particular David, um, her son. And we need to be praying for, of course. And does anybody have anything else? We, let's pray for Jacob. Jacob's going on Sunday to back to Wisconsin to go to school. So we'll be praying for Jacob. The we'll, Warhawks. The Warhawks, mm -hmm. that's right. Be praying for you. Um, anybody have anything else? Um, let's pray. God, thank you for um, time together tonight. It was really, really good to be back together studying your word and um, there's a lot of really exciting chapters ahead in Genesis, and this one really is such a reminder to us, God, about the importance of, of our relationship with you and the covenant, Lord, that we have with you, that we wouldn't take that for granted or defile that, Lord, that we would um, keep priority of you in our life. And, and just a reminder again, Lord, of people... Um, setting up idols, even their, their own selves or their family members, um, Lord, in, in, in your place um, and not seeking after your will, not seeking after your heart. And Lord, we want to be people who seek after you, who know you, who love you, who put you first in our lives. And so God, help us to always be thinking um, just like we talked about on Sunday, Lord, to be thinking, um, setting our minds for action, Lord, and be thinking about things that um, honor you and be thinking about your, your kingdom and how we can bring that about here on earth. We think of Harmony House tonight, and we just pray for them and um, those who are affected by COVID, people who are close to us, Deb and Ralph, Harold, Rebbe. David, Barb, all of them, Lord, we just pray your presence would be with them, that you would guide them and, and keep them, Lord, that your hand would be upon them, Lord, that healing would take place where it's needed, that they would gain strength in you, Lord Jesus. We trust you with all of that, and um, we give this time to you. We give our, our friends and family to you, Lord, and knowing, God, that you are Lord of all, and we love you in Jesus' name. Thanks, everybody here for joining us. Thank you online for joining us. Good to see all of you. Take care.